welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Turn the Page hot, uh, Podcast. I'm your host, Ralph Gatil, librarian here at the Sayasa Public Library. I'm here with author Don Holloway, whose book, upcoming book, The Last Viking, tells the story of the King Harold Hodrada. Pleased to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, to start off with, um, let maybe talk a little bit about yourself. Like, What brought you to write this book? What uh, interested you in this man that uh, made you want to do this? I've always been a history buff, uh, been a magazine writer for off and on for, gee, close to 30 years and uh, never really, well, I guess I always exp- uh, aspired to write a book, but never really had the opportunity to come along and trying to find an agent and everything is, uh, you know, it's a bottomless pit. Mm-hmm. So I was, uh, I've pretty much established myself as a magazine writer for History Magazines, and one of my editors actually hooked me up with an agent, and the agent got contacted me and said, uh, Vikings are hot right now because of the television show, and do you have any uh, any stories about Vikings? And I said, well, let me tell you a story. I had okay. read about the Harold Hadrada years ago as a kid and read about his life story, and it was like, man, what a book this would make. And I just never had the opportunity to write it. I was actually going to write it as a magazine article, but that wouldn't have done it justice. So mm-hmm. when this opportunity came along, I jumped on it. Excellent. And I guess, what do you think? Is there, you think, a reason right now why you think Vikings? I mean, the show is, is, is being probably the last Viking and the Viking show. I think there's a reason it's come out now and not before, or has it maybe always been popular? We just haven't covered it yet. Oh, I think Vikings have always been popular. I mean, I go on the whole way back to the old uh, movie uh, with uh, Kirk Douglas and uh, Tony Curtis, uh, Janet Lee going, I mean, that's that's like the 50s back then. And you've always had your B-grade movies about Vikings. Yeah. There's uh, mm-hmm. something, something about that that appeals to people because they just uh, lived by their own rules, I think. Okay. Yeah, I would agree. I think it's something about their like, you know, their wild nature and you know, these these mysterious invaders from far away coming and then Correct. destroying everything in their path. And, <laughs> and I gotta admit, I think the coolest spot, even though this it's not historically accurate, everybody loves the horns on the head. I think that's what <laughs> <laughs> the, the horns, horns and the wings, the eagle wings on the yes. head, on the helmet. Yeah, that's the two big things. And and I, I'm a historical reenactor and anytime we see that stuff, it's like <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Forget it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Done. I wonder, I guess, I think it came from, did that originate in some kind of popular art that came from, or what did they, I wonder what it, it was. It was really cranked up in the Victorian age. You didn't really see it until Victorian times. And then I right. think with uh, the Wagnerian operas, yeah. uh, you know, Brunhilde, she was always uh, wearing the winged helmet and everything, the Valkyries. and. Uh, I think they sort of brought it into into play then, and people just sort of ran with it for so many years. But I I don't see why, because if you look in the you know museum exhibits, there's not a single helmet that has a horn, nary a horn or a wing to be found. So I don't know why it, right. that's why it stayed popular. Take me through the process. Like, what made you like you mentioned? Like, it was a really interesting story to Harold Hadrada. Is there, I mean, there's other tales. Is there a lot of documentation with him? Obviously a problem, uh, you know, in history is finding the sources and things like that for information. Oh yeah, oh yeah, lots. I mean, he was he was a world traveler. I mean, his story started in Norway mm. when he was uh, 15 years old and he was, uh, he was uh, half brother to the current Norwegian king. His older half brother was Olaf II. Mm. And uh, young Harold was actually in the battle where Harold fell at Stiklestad in Northern Norway which was actually fought under a partial, well, not, it was partially fought under a total eclipse of the sun. So for people in that day and age to have the sun go out in the middle of the battle was something of mythological importance. I mean, the pagans who were there, they would have thought of one-eyed Odin, the, their, their patriarchal god who only had one eye. And the Christians who were fighting, this was almost exactly a thousand years after Christ was crucified. So they would have thought, you know, world-ending uh, battle here. 
Right. So that was all pretty well chronicled in Scandinavian chronicles, Viking sagas and such. But after that, Harold had to escape. He was basically an exile, an outlaw. He went to his uh, distant relatives in Russia. There were accounts of him written there. From there, he went on down to Constantinople, which was the capital of the Byzantine Empire. Mm -hmm. There were plenty of chronicles written by people who were there and met him. And uh, he's, his story is he fought for them. He fought for them for 10 years and uh, mm -hmm. uh, ultimately rose very high in their society. So there were plenty of uh, background sources, primary sources for him. Okay. That's good, at least. All right. Okay. So he was, I mean, at the time, I guess he was a bit of an anomaly. I mean, going all over the place like that, the travels, the battles, I'm sure he fought. Mm -hmm. um, is there something about him that, that kind of his personality kind of stood out to you that really like, wow, this guy's really, you know, interesting? Uh, yeah, I mean, he was like uh, the Viking personality uh, concentrated. <laughs> okay. I mean, okay. He, he, was, he was like the Vikings Viking. Uh, okay. As I say, when he went to Russia, he was only 15, 16 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, because, because of his royal connections, he had kinship among the, the princes over there in Russia and uh, joined their bodyguard. And in those days, you, you didn't necessarily have to be a great fighter to mm -hmm. lead men. You could be 16 years old, but if you were of royal blood, you had been raised to lead men. You knew how to do that. That was one of the things that they trained you in. So he naturally picked up a lot of followers among, among the Russians. Uh, a lot of the Swedish Vikings, the Norwegians and Danes all moved towards England and France, but the Swedes went across the Baltic towards Russia, and they had actually founded their own empire over there in Russia, and that's the people he was talking to or dealing with then. Mm. So he more or less rose to the top of that pile and mm. uh, actually aspired to uh, marry the princess, but he was still you know, just a, basically a glorified bodyguard. And the uh, Prince Yaroslav said, you know, you're a great guy, but <laughs> you don't have anything, you don't have anything going here. So right. Harold, that's when Harold decided to go down to Constantinople and, and seek his fortune in the Mediterranean. Okay. You yeah, some of the stories of, of Germanic and also even Scandinavian groups making their way down to like North Africa and, you know, the Middle East and Constantinople. I always found it amazing to me that, wow, you know, it's just the, the courage that people had just to just pack up and go and that for adventure, for fortune, for... Right. It's great. And, and he basically traveled the whole world. I mean, he, uh, in, in service to the Byzantines, he is actually among the uh, first um, imperial delegations to Jerusalem at that time, which was held by the Muslims, the Saracens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they, they had struck a peace treaty and left uh, an imperial delegation come down to Jerusalem. And he was actually part of that. That's in the documentation. And actually went through Jerusalem to uh, the River Jordan mm -hmm. and uh, bathed in the River Jordan, which was a, you know, religious experience for everybody at that point. I mean, the object of pilgrimages and everything. Mm -hmm. And then just a few months later, he's on the other side of the empire fighting in Sicily. Wow. fighting the Saracens over there when Jeez. he was just uh, at a peace wow. treaty on the other side. Wow. So he dovetails a lot with the, the Byzantines. I always found the, their story very interesting. It's uh, something that's not exactly covered that much, I think. In right. It's more, of a, it's more of a, it's more of a, you have to think of them as like a, a Grecian society mm. with, with Roman bureaucracy or something. I mean, they're, they're actually the, the remnant of the Eastern half of the Roman empire. The Western half had fallen like 600 years before this. So the Byzantines sort of continued that, but they being based over there in Greece sort of took that, uh, took that society to heart. And that's what made them so much different. Right. And the Byzantine empire lasted for a thousand years. I mean, they, right. 1432, something like that. Something like that. <laughs> okay, yeah, something like that. Yeah, I, I just, I read a few books on it and I remember the podcast and I just really found it really interesting. I think like, a lot of people, mm -hmm. more people know about this and just, anyway. Right. Okay. So in doing so, like, how did you, I guess, is there a certain process that you follow? Like, I know everybody, every author has their own methodology. I mean, do you sort of like, all right, here's the primary sources. How am I going to put this into a, a coherent tale that, because I'm always, always amazed by writers who can, and I'm reading just a brief part of the book before the podcast, just, you make it into a story, almost like a fiction book. It's, it's nonfiction that reads like fiction. I always think that's so impressive because usually it's more of, unfortunately, the image of history sometimes is that dry, you know, kind of like, and this happened, right. and that happened, and that yeah. happened. 
you make it into that's exactly book. that's exactly the kind of book i was trying to write because i hate that kind of book as well the ones right. it's just yeah. dry delivery of places dates you know people i wanted to really write this as uh you know put the reader alongside him or in his head at certain points and right. let them make the journey along with him and there were so many sources of either people talking in their own voices about Harold or yeah. people who were reporting what he himself said at the same at the at the time. Mm. So it was easy to take that and you know I, I knew the general arc of the story, how it was going to go. And mm. all I do is have my sources open all around me and just keep as I'm progressing through the story, I turn pages to get keep them all right. up with me and I'm just taking all that and putting it together. Right. And, uh, and and bringing the story, taking all those sources and putting them into one story. Okay, excellent. Okay, so you mentioned before I, I look at some at your bio, and it says you uh, you mentioned this before. You're a historical reenactor. So is it mostly from kind of this period, or is it other? What kind of period? Uh, I'm actually a member of a 17th century group. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's like uh, Three Musketeers time or something like that. Okay, uh, we do we do everything from. Um, late Renaissance into um, you know late 17th century English Civil War 30 Years War. Okay. We are the cannon crew at the Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair, which is oh, awesome. nice. Okay, awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. always it's on my it's on everybody's bucket list. Fire a cannon. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> wow. Okay. Huh. So I mean, do you get the I guess sort of like look at the primary sources and you get an idea that people are making the costumes and making every all the uh, oh it's it's a uh, rabbit hole I mean I, you can you you can get so lost in the details you have to at certain at a certain point you just have to say I have dumped enough money into this I'm just gonna right. go with what I've got I mean right. there are there are people who. Uh, not only want the authentic fabrics for their clothing, they know the how the original hand stitching was done. They know if the pattern was wrong. Uh, there, there's different degrees of it. Uh, there's like there's what's called the ten foot rule that if you can pass for real at ten feet, you're oh, good. Okay. <laughs> but a lot of people, that's not good enough. They they want it to be you know dead on realistic, and uh, that just depends how much money you want to throw at, and time throw at the project. Yeah, I've always been impressed with that. I, mean, I went to the Renaissance Fair here in New York uh, a few years ago, and I remember I just saw, I mean, I, obviously I, I couldn't fact check to see whether these were accurate, but I was looking at some of the outfits. I was like, that's pretty accurate. That's pretty, you know, I mean, a lot of times with the Renaissance Fairs, you can kind of drift into sort of Dungeons and Dragons fantasy, kind right. of, you know. Lots of pirates. Many, Lots of pirates. <laughs> Two-handed curved swords and stuff like that, all these, you know, right. wild things, but yeah, okay. Um, have you ever, do they have, I would imagine they do have them for the, this era also, the Viking era, the uh, Norse? Yes, I was just, uh, I was just at a uh, Viking fest in Ohio a couple of weeks ago. And uh, uh -huh. you, you think it's tough wearing wool clothing and armor? Do it in like 90 degree heat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> yeah, so I think the, I think they're, the upcoming events now, we're skipping until like September, October, November, when the weather's a little cool and more Scandinavian, I suppose. Yes. Okay. So do you think that, I mean, this Viking moment that we've had, these, these Viking moments, they've always been popular. Do you mm -hmm. think, well, I'll, I'll ask this. Do you see it like continuing on? Do you think people um, they'll always have this fascination over this period, over where these, you know, because I mean, it depends, I guess, what side of the, the fence you're on. I guess if you were being attacked by them, they weren't exactly the nicest guys. They weren't exactly. Uh, it, that's very, that's very true. My, my ancestors uh, are from England. I haven't traced them back to Viking times, but, uh, I, you know, my people come from England and they would have all been on the receiving end of the Viking uh, attacks and would have definitely, you know, dreaded the name of Harold Hadrada, uh, as many English people did at the time. So, yeah, there, there's always that side. Um, I would say a lot of the Viking reenactors and a lot of the Viking enthusiasts that I know mm. are not all about the, you know, the bloodshed and the raiding. Uh, right. They're more about the drinking. <laughs> <laughs> always. They're more the drinking and the partying. <laughs> yes, yes. It's funny, just this weekend I went to a brewery and they had mead. I was like, ah, oh, mead. Yes, I want to try mead. I just, you know, I mean, I've also. actually made mead. I have, I have really? one of these and we made, we made some of our own mead. Uh, it, ours came out different. It was more, 
more like wine, whereas a lot of the meat that you that you find in a liquor store is more like hard booze or something. So yeah. it, maybe maybe they distill theirs to get to that point. I don't know. Huh. Okay. Okay. Have you ever? I know you mentioned uh, kind of jumping back and forth here, but you mentioned sure. historical reenactment. Have you ever done things like say role playing or a sort of more on the fantastic end of things, or you're pretty much fine enough in the real? Uh, yeah, I try to stick to, to pretty much the historic end of it, but there's a certain amount of role playing that comes into it. I mean, when we do our, our canon demonstrations, uh, you know, you have to know exactly everybody in there has a role. We have more or less of a script that we follow for our shows okay. and uh, to explain what's going on to the audience. And of course, everybody on the canon crew is a, is a, well, they're beyond playing a role. They're not playing a role. We're we're operating that cannon mm -hmm. very carefully, very safely, and and sure. uh, and like that. But when you're in an event and people are coming up to you, uh, you're you're trying to stay in character. I find it myself hard to do. I mean, I I try to start out with an English accent and everything, but I start mm -hmm. to lose it. As soon as yeah, I yeah. To talk uh -huh. <laughs> but the sure. but the good ones, the good ones can keep up the whole persona, the English accent, and everything, and that, that's something that I aspire to. Okay. Yeah, I remember going to uh, Plymouth Plantation in Massachusetts, and uh, they have a whole they have uh, Native Americans as well as settlers there, and then the, the way they kept that up, I was always very like. You can talk to me regular. It's okay. It's, it's all right. Nope. <laughs> it's Disney. I'm like, nope. That's the character and that's it. Uh, okay. Yeah, I do the same thing when I uh, when I go to my 17th century things. If we're if we're doing if we're representing an, an English company, I don't do it so much. But if we're doing something that occurred over here in the 17th century, then I try and take on the persona of a tradesman at that time or a trader, I should say. Mm -hmm. uh with uh furs and traps and and uh tobacco i mean tobacco plants you know things that would have actually been done the 17th century here on the eastern seaboard was uh really a pivotal time for this country i mean you had you had like basically five countries that were trying to get a foothold right here on the east coast you had you right. had the english you had the dutch you had the swedes you had the french up in canada the spanish down in florida mm -hmm. And they're all arming the natives, trying to get control of the uh, fur trade. And uh, for a couple of years, it could, it could have gone either way. I mean, basically, the Swedes bailed out because their king, Gustavus, was killed in the Thirty Years' War over mm -hmm. in Europe. And it was sort of his personal project, and they sort of lost interest in it. And the Dutch took their part over, and then the English threw them out. And just over basically 200, 150, 200 years, it got down to be the English and the French until like 1763. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. All right. Yeah. We forget sometimes that I forget that the uh, the Swedes were involved in the, in the sort of the exploration project here. I think it's kind of neglected sometimes, but yeah, there was a strong right. presence here. Definitely. I know a strong yeah, immigrant presence, of course, but around Delaware, New Jersey, right? Right. Okay. Strange. It's also like I don't know. It's funny the image of the Viking and not the image, but what the Vikings were in terms of what, I guess it's, it's how modern day, the, the descendants, we think mm -hmm. of Norwegian countries, Scandinavian countries now, and we love them together, and they're actually very quite distinct from each other, but we they are together, um, are very, um, I would say borderline, pa pa you know, pacifistic, and right. uh, very, not going with the Viking image at all. It's very different. I guess right. you the same thing. I mean, in Mongolia too, you have, you know, the ancient, the, uh, the raiders of the, the Mongolian Empire, but yet today it's a very, you know, when was the last time you heard about Mongolia, really anything? I know this, right. stuff with, you know, with China relations, you hear about it, but that's right. it. Right. Well, they, I think, I think the, the Scandinavians sort of taught themselves that pacifism was better because one of the reasons that Harold Hadrada is called the last Viking is that he was really uh, the, the person who personified the end of the age he had spent rather than once he came home rather than try to uh, uh you know go down and conquer european countries and everything he waged a 15-year war with denmark just like that's basically a civil war between vikings and they bled each other white and mm -hmm. finally it got to a stalemate uh, he never did manage to conquer denmark and that's when uh the brother of the english king came, came over and said hey you couldn't 
you couldn't conquer Denmark. Let's how about taking a shot at England and we'll go over here and see how that works out. And that was basically the end of the Viking age. Everyone, everyone dates that to 1066 when Harold died on the battlefield. Hmm. 1066, a very pivotal year, I guess. Wow. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Right, right down to a very, very few weeks. I mean, you say 1066, everybody thinks of Hastings, which was yeah. in early October, wow. but actually a couple of weeks before that, in late September, like the 20th to the 25th of 1066 is when Harold invaded the north of England okay. and actually took York uh, up there and was set to come down and invade the rest of England and mm -hmm. beat William the Conqueror to the punch. But okay. King Harold, the other King Harold, the English King Harold, marched his army the whole way up England mm -hmm. in one of the greatest forced marches ever, ever done in medieval history, defeated mm -hmm. Harold, and then had to come marching the whole way back down to take on William at Hastings where he was killed and historians right. often wonder what might have happened if Harold hadn't invaded you know just a few weeks before William did uh, right. because Harold the English Harold basically spent his entire force up there fighting at Stamford Bridge where Harold was killed and then had to come the whole way back down and right. just was not up to it then. Wow okay huh I guess hmm. Yeah, it's one of those, that would be a good subject maybe for an alternate history, like what if, you know, Hastings had gone the other way. That's right. Part of the book. But um, especially like English history, I mean, because the Vikings, I guess, they made their mark wherever they went. I mean, to this day, you still see their mark in the societies and the cultures, the names, mm -hmm. the places, and um, in particular, do you think, do you think that maybe what, what the Vikings represent to people is sort of that, sense of adventure that that kind of like i guess the positive aspect would be that sense of like let's just go somewhere and just you know find my fortune elsewhere there's always been a kind of viking spirit i guess in a lot of people that you know i'm getting kind of right uh, i understand I, I just, you know what i mean it's I just, understand uh, where you're going yeah i i it's i think we talked about it earlier i think there's a certain admiration for a bunch of guys who will just uh you know pick up and go and uh try and take what they want from the world and let right. anybody try and come stop them right. and uh you know in the beginning of the viking age there weren't too many people who could stop them but mm -hmm. towards the end of the viking age people had gotten used to it and 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 knew how to stop them and that's you know part of the reason why it sort of died out then you think was it the surprise that really was uh, was their uh, advantage or was it the numbers or was it the way they fought Mm -hmm. Oh, it was definitely a surprise. I mean, most of the Viking battles uh, that you see against other people were strictly raids. They did not want to tangle with an army if they could possibly avoid it. I mean, their, their, their operation was to appear out of nowhere, take a place, burn everything, grab whatever they wanted, and get the heck out before the army got there. Okay. And uh, that's how they did most, accomplish most of their stuff. Uh, if, you, if you see Viking battles against other Vikings, it's a whole different thing. I talk about a battle in the book uh, mm -hmm. that took place off the Nisa River in uh, Sweden. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a battle between the Danes, as I was saying, the Danes and the Norwegians. It was a battle at sea that went on all night. The ships were all tied together and mm -hmm. there was nothing quick about it. They just slaughtered each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the kind of fight that they would try to avoid if they possibly could. Okay. I see there's something people don't know about that. They always think that they were this all conquering, uh, you know, unstoppable wave, but it was, they really did rely on surprise instead. Okay. Yes, exactly. Yes. Okay. So getting back to you, how, you mentioned this was your first work that you've done as a, as a full length book. First book length, book length work, right. Um, have you done things previous to this? Like you've written like essays or not, not essays, I should say. Yeah, little uh, shorter pieces in other words. Oh. Ton, tons of magazine articles, I think over, okay. uh, I think I haven't done a recent count, but I think it's like over 50. Nice. And, wow, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. History, aviation, uh, 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 my two big loves. So that's, that's what I write about. Is this someplace where readers could find maybe some of your previous work that they're interested? Yes. My website has a lot of my greatest hits. Okay. <laughs> or links, okay. to, links to the publishers that have them on the site. You can go to donhallway.com and okay. uh, find most of my, uh, like I say, my greatest hits. But you have to spell my last name right. It's not hollow way, it's hallway, H-O-L-L-W-A-Y. -L -L <laughs> right. okay. I, I mentioned that my ancestors came from England, 
uh, my daughter actually tracked us on Ancestry.com to where one of my relatives was mm. hollow way when he got on the boat in England and he was hallway when he got off over yeah. in Canada. <laughs> uh, we, you have to make with the O's. We, 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 not, we get it. Got to, no, Think no. of all the time I'm going to save by not pronouncing that extra Exactly. O. <laughs> I'm tired today. I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> Does, um, okay. All right. So we have it there. Cause I, I always ask because I always think there's places, you know, different places where uh, I always like to read uh, some of these shorter essays. And I love like the BBC History magazine. I like to read those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I consider myself a history buff as well, you know, from mm -hmm. I, I tend to like more the ancients and the medieval times and the modern. And when you get to gunpowder, right. I'm like, eh, okay, okay. Yeah, <laughs> but just, All that magazine writing kind of trained me for it, I think, because yeah. you have to really write to a specific length. I mean, an editor will say, yeah, I like this topic. Uh, I need 2,500 words or 3,000 words. And you had better hit that, not go you know, too far over or too far under because he needs to be able to plan for that. So when it came to writing the book, I mean, I knew the, the overall story arc and it was just a matter of cutting it up into short sections. And I didn't have to hit the word count, but it made it easier for me to say, okay, you know, writing a book can be an overwhelming project when you're starting out and you're looking at that vast expense of sure. wordage that's out in front of you. But it's a matter of uh, saying to yourself, just reminding yourself, you know, I only got to get to the end of this chapter right here. And I've done that a thousand times. I'm just going to write that. You get okay. that one under your belt. You look at the next one and mm -hmm. it's just chunk, 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 chunk. And you okay. move towards to the end. Okay. So it was good training, I think, to write the book. Okay. Excellent. Okay, uh, with that, I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, I want to thank you, Mr. Holloway, for the, uh, your time. And I'm really looking forward to reading this book. I started a little bit. I'm definitely going to continue because I am a fan <laughs> of the whole era. And um, it'll give me a nice historical uh, perspective. I usually read the fiction more. I've read, you know, the Bernard Coral series. And mm -hmm. this will give me a really definitely more grounded. And I enjoy the part with, you know, sort of Byzantine history as well. So it'll be a nice little melting of everything. So I'm really looking forward to this book. Well, I think you'll enjoy this one because I tried to, it's not a fiction book, but I tried to write it like a novel, right. uh, you know, using the quotes and hearing the people talk. Uh, mm. that, that, that's what I wanted to bring to the whole story. And, and that's what I hope you'll find when you read it. Okay. I look forward to it. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.